All right, welcome to our afternoon session on uh, the Spatial Temporal Data Store. Uh, I'm Adam Olikoff, I'm the real-time and the big data capability lead for our platform, and with me I have Ricardo Trujillo, who's on the, the real-time and big data team as well. We're gonna be walking you through a number of topics. Uh, we have a lot to cover, so uh, we're gonna try to go through the, the basics pretty quick and then get more into the, the interesting things. Uh, well, first, we're going to kind of cover why do we need a new type of data store. We've got a relational data store, and we've got other enterprise geodatabases, so why do we need this? We'll cover those topics. Uh, we'll do a demo of visualizing observational data uh, and how you can visualize uh, with different techniques on top of the spatial temporal data store. Uh, we'll also talk about how the configuration happens in, within GeoEvent server so that we can write data into the spatial temporal data store. And then we'll cover in more depth the uh, on-the-fly aggregation capability that we have. We'll do a little bit of a deep dive under the hood of what's happening as far as a spatial index and other things uh, within the spatial temporal data store. And then we'll talk about, at a high level, uh, how GeoAnalytics server integrates at the spatial temporal data store as well. Uh, deeper dive, uh, we'll cover additional topics. And then uh, time allowing, I'm going to show you a really cool R&D project sneak peek. Uh, you may have seen it if you went to the WebGL session yesterday, uh, but we'll talk about uh, how we can do some, some more interesting aggregations on the fly. So why a new type of uh, data store? So the evolution of real-time GIS uh, at the 10.3 release, we were dealing with about 3,000 events per second that we could ingest into here. A lot of our customers were experiencing a fundamental problem, and that fundamental problem was they couldn't store the data that we were receiving within GeoEvent Server. So at 10.3, we actually created this thing called the stream service and a stream layer and this allowed us to push data up to clients without first having to write it to the database. Uh, this was kind of an uh, in-between solution because the next thing people wanted to do, even when they could get 3,000 events per second on a display, is rewind that and see what happened just before. So the stream service doesn't give us that capability. Uh, and we, at the 10.3 release, as part of WebGIS, introduced an ArcGIS data store as a component of the WebGIS. And that introduced the concept of a relational data store, which is fundamentally Postgres underneath. underneath. Uh, this also was subject to the same constraint problem, uh, that we couldn't update more than about 200 events per second. And this was just due to the way that GeoVent was writing into this using feature services and other aspects. So to overcome that at the 10.4 release, we introduced a new type of ArcGIS data store uh, called the Spatial Temporal Big Data Store. I'll mention here, because this is usually the first question I get in Q&A is, you know, what's the license for the big data store? There is no license for the big data store. As long as you have a ArcGIS Enterprise or Portal license, you have the rights to deploy as many nodes of the big data store as you want. You can deploy 100 nodes, you can deploy three nodes, it's up to you how you want to do that. The only cost to you is uh, the physical hardware uh, or the resources on the cloud. There's no additional licensing concept for that. So that's why the Spatial Temporal Big Data Store has all lowercase letters. It's a component of our platform. It's not a product. It's just a component of our platform. With the Spatial Temporal Data Store introduced at the 10.4 release, we were able to sustain the rates that GeoEvent uh, can produce. In fact, we've benchmarked the Spatial Temporal Big Data Store with uh, a two or three node cluster to be able to do about 100,000 writes per second. Uh, so we're not even nearly trying to, to, to peak where uh, it can, it can uh, get constrained. Fundamentally, the Spatial Temporal Big Data Store underneath it is Elasticsearch. We've written a bunch of extensions and plugins for Elasticsearch that make it perform faster and do things with Spatial a lot better, which we're going to go through the course of this talk. Another key component, uh, well, here's kind of the, the scale out solution. So if you add multiple geo events writing into this, say 12,000 events per second, no problem keeping up with those rates, as I kind of mentioned before. Another aspect of the, the spatial temporal big data store is that we've enhanced the feature services and map services that come with ArcGIS Enterprise, such that when they're working with a spatial temporal big data store, instead of returning back to you 200 million observations, that you would then render as dots on the screen, we can do aggregation on the fly, so you can get a picture of what's happening. And it's on the fly on purpose because when real-time data, real data is streaming in, you don't want to calculate an aggregate and then have a static result that's not changing when your real-time data is flowing in. So you really need to do the aggregations on the fly, and the Spatial Temporal Big Data Store is optimized uh, to do that both over space and time as well as any other attributes that you do on a, on a where clause. At the 10.5 release, uh, the Spatial Temporal Big Data Store remains a fundamental uh, component for the real-time and the big data aspects of our platform. Uh, for a real-time perspective, it's enabling us a, a place to put the data that we receive in our real-time streams. 
And then also for GeoAnalytics Server, this new at 10.5, we have a place that we can do more batch analysis on the observations that we've stored through GeoEvent Server, or we could simply uh, load data in from a big data file system, uh, like HDFS or Hive or something of that nature, or it might just be a folder full of shapefiles or other things that you want to bring data in. GeoAnalytics can either just load that data into the big data store so that you can then visualize and explore your data, or it can do analysis on the data before it's written. Uh, so it's really flexible, and there's a number of tools that we'll go through later in this talk. GeoAnalytics is fundamentally based on Spark. Uh, we've written a number of UDFs, or user-defined functions, for Spark. Uh, we've extended Spark with our own kind of uh, spatial capabilities, uh, and we'll talk through what some of those operators and analytics are later in this discussion. Uh, one of the key things I want to cover here is uh, that a minimum environment for real-time and big data typically consists of, of a four-machine setup. So certainly if you're doing you know, development or you're just doing a proof of concept, you can put all of these onto one machine, and we do that very often at Esri, uh, just to have a self-contained environment. But when you de go to deploy a production environment, you should plan to isolate these environments uh, across this. It's due to the, the way the resources are used across these different products. So GeoVent Server is very CPU and RAM intensive, uh, depending on how many geofences and other spatial analysis that you want to perform. GeoAnalytics is also very CPU and RAM intensive as well. So if you put those two on the same machine, it might work well for a while when you're running GeoVent Server and maybe you're streaming in 1,000 events per second. But when you run a GeoAnalytics job that takes four or five minutes to complete, it's going to completely contend for those CPUs and, and RAM and everything else on that machine. And so you're going to fall back on how much you can actually stream in in GeoVent Server. So it's typically not a good idea to put these on the same machine. Likewise, in the Spatial Temporal Big Data Store, it's very I.O. network and uh, RAM intensive uh, as well. So GeoVent is continuously writing into the Big Data Store as its data is being written into the Big Data Store, as you'll see in a bit. There's lots of indices and index uh, things that happen uh, so that we can prepare the data for the aggregations on the fly. We can prepare the data for general queries. And so this indexing is constantly happening, which is I.O. on the disk. Uh, it's also CPU intensive to calculate those indexes. Uh, and then if you have queries flying in from feature services or map services, those are contending for the same CPUs and RAM as well. So putting these all on isolated machines is the best practice deployment for this. Don't attempt to put these on the same machine. That's typically the first mistake that we see when customers call us with incidents, is that they've got things co-located on the same machine. That's the minimum environment. What we recommend, if you truly have a real-time and a big data kind of use case, uh, this shouldn't be surprising at all, uh, that you're going to need a number of machines to do this. Uh, but our recommended environment is to actually have a three-node cluster of, of big data store. Uh, and so this allows you to uh, have better data reliability. So if you had a single node big data store and that disk failed, then you're kind of, there's no data availability anymore. And so if you have a three node cluster, what we do when we write into the big data store is that we have replicas and you can define a replication factor across that NoSQL cluster. And as we write, we can say, I want to replicate at least to one other node in the cluster. And if a disk fails on one of the machines, the secondaries will take over. And if you query anything while that disk has failed, you still get the same result. So there's no data loss, there's high availability of the data, everything's in a good state. And this is an N plus one architecture. So N being you need at least two machines to have backups, uh, and then a plus one so that if there is a failure, you can still sustain over time without having to immediately uh, remediate that machine. The GeoAnalytics server, we typically recommend that you have at least as many GeoAnalytics servers as you have big data store nodes. Uh, in some cases, if you have twice as many, it's even better because uh, analytics can be performed across that. So the licensable components here are GeoVent server and GeoAnalytics server, uh, so certainly choose those things appropriately. It doesn't make much sense to have one GeoAnalytics server and three big data store nodes because it's not going to parallelize the data uh, in an optimal fashion in that way. Uh, for the high-level story here, we have you know, multiple aspects of our platform. You can think of GeoVent server as a functional server that extends the capabilities of ArcGIS Enterprise to handle real-time GIS. And GeoAnalytics Server is, is uh, adding capabilities to ArcGIS Enterprise by providing the way to do very fast, uh, performant, and parallelized algorithms on, on big data that's at rest. So as far as visualizing observation data, there's a number of different classes of observation data. Uh, there's things that move. So those are the you know, planes and vehicles and animals and things. This is what people typically think about when they think of observation data or real-time GIS. 
Uh, but most, uh, or just as important uh, to that is stationary data. So these are things that don't move, but their status changes all the time. So there may be you know, 15 attributes that are constantly changing on these stationary items. Their geometries are static, but we get lots of updates over time. And then there's also discrete events. So these are things that just happen. So this could be a crime or a lightning strike or, or things of that nature. So they typically don't have continuity, but they have some type of event that happened in time, and then they're discrete and not really continued. So most of the times we're dealing with moving and stationary observations, but it's kind of worth noting the different types that we have here. To give observation data a definition, uh, you can think of it as a features, attributes, and values at some specific moment in time. Typically they're immutable, so that means that you wouldn't really edit it over time. Uh, I like to describe this as a film strip where we're capturing cells in the film strip and then you can go back and replay that film strip. Uh, when we first introduced the big data store, we introduced it here at the Dev Summit uh, last year, I think, right? No, two years ago. Two years ago. Wow, it's been two years. Uh, and when we introduced that, we said it's not possible to edit these the data in the big data store, and we didn't really enable those operations on there. And we got a lot of feedback that said, I need to be able to edit these things. So now at the 10.5 release, you can edit. Uh, you have full edit capabilities over the data in the big data store. Uh, also, uh, this is really optimized for replaying over space and time. So being a spatial temporal data store, it's optimized for access by space, by time, by any combination of those two, uh, as well as any other where constraint clauses that you might put on it. So the space and time down below is kind of showing different distribution over uh, different points in time for that day. Uh, with moving observations, there's typically an identifiable unique attribute that we call the track ID. And these track IDs can be used to correlate the events that have happened for a track uh, and put those back together. And with our geoanalytics capabilities uh, at 10.5, we actually can reconstruct these tracks over space and time. Uh, and you can kind of see a visual depiction of that uh, over time here where the blue and the purple items are different tracks. So the Spatial Temporal Big Data Store enables you to aggregate things on the fly as well. So this is really important for real-time data because things are constantly changing. Uh, but you can also perform a lot of exploratory analysis uh, using the combination of, of queries across this data over space, time, and any kind of attribute query that you want to perform. What's cool is that you can actually toggle from aggregate view to raw feature view as well. So you could say that you know, whenever there's less than 1,000 features, I want to render a you know, arrow display with a heading that's oriented th with the right direction. Uh, and I can also always access the feature level attributes, uh, either in aggregate view or feature level view. So if you click on one of the cells that has you know, an aggregate count on it, you can page through a lot of the events that are in that cell. Uh, but you can also do that with, within this. So this is kind of looking at it from a map service perspective. Uh, to better understand this and kind of uh, get a more tangible view on this, Ricardo is going to walk us through a, a quick illustration of things in action. Oh, thank you, Adam. So yeah, I'm really excited to show you guys our, our work we've been working on for the last year or so, a couple years. What you guys are looking at is what Adam just described. We have a um, regular map service but which has been enhanced to do aggregation on the fly. So the first thing you notice is there's not actually, this is actually point feature data being rendered in rectangular polygons. And that's actually to, uh, to actually create these better visualization techniques so we can visualize millions of point data really quickly, really fast, and aggregate these on the fly. Um, just wanted to do a quick query on the data. That's a couple moments ago, but I'm streaming this live data, and it's actually at 28 million points or so right now. Um, this is actually a live feed we're getting from the FlightAware uh, folks that we're just streaming that in into GeoVents and then we're writing it out to the spatial temporal big data store. So the real neat thing about the aggregation map service is as we zoom in, we can see that the data gets re-aggregated on the fly and based on your level of, of detail or your extent, we get more detailed bins here. The really cool thing I like about this is as we start zooming into one of the hotspots here, obviously New York area has three airports here. Uh, we can see where those flights kind of are concentrated, right? Um, but I like, I like this really neat feature as we zoom in where we have less features than what we've configured to draw, let's just say, um, we have a parameter in the map service called a feature threshold. 
we actually start visualizing the raw data. These are the actual individual flights, just as Adam mentioned. We're actually visualizing the, the, the flights here with the little pointer, simple, simple symbology supported here. But the cool thing is if I pan around here and I get to an area where um, flights start to get more dense, I can actually see that it starts aggregating on the fly once again. So we can see here by keep panning or by zoom back out, we can see the bins right there. And it's really responsive. You see, as I'm just panning around, zooming in, starts aggregating on the fly. So this is a great example of moving observations. Um, so the next map I wanted to show you guys is actually an example of, of uh, stationary observations. So this map is actually a map of uh, weather stations. It's pulling in a feed from NOAA, which is just a straight feature service that we pull every five minutes. As you can see, the map right here, it's interesting, but it's, we're aggregating based on the count of the data. But for stationary uh, observations, that's not really interesting to us because it's the same point over and over pulled every five minutes for X number of days or months. So one thing we can do with the, um, with the spatial temporal big data storage, we can actually aggregate by value. So the other map I have here is a temperature map. I turn that one on. I'm actually doing aggregations, not by counts, by actually a value in the, in the data. This is actually doing um, average temperature of the data. And the cool thing is, well, this is a temperature map of the United States. Obviously, as we, if we look at the data at, a, at the global view, you can see it's, it's blue on the pools and, and red near the equator, sing, signaling cold and and hot right there. But the cool thing too is we can keep the, the colors kind of consistent everywhere we pan to as well. So that, that's a really cool example of, 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 survey, of stationary observations. One other thing we can do though is we can enable um, uh, time animation. Like Adam said, we can filter based on many different ways. One of the ways we can filter here is based on time. So as we, as we um, I've set up a time um, interval of about eight hours. So as we step through it, we're going to see the map turn more blue. Obviously at night, it's colder. And then as we turn morning, it gets redder. Kind of a different way to view your data and large amounts of data in this aggregate view. Uh, got one more map. The last map is a sample of discrete observations. So this is zoomed into the Washington, D.C. area. And these are actually crime activity, crime incidents that we've been captured, and we're just replaying it on a, on a simulator here that I'm just uh, consuming it with GeoVent. And this is for uh, last year, 2016. Um, one, one neat thing you can see right off the bat is this map is not aggregating based on GeoHash, it's actually aggregating based on our hexagons, which is kind of neat. Um, again, as we zoom in, we can see crime is located near the downtown area here. But uh, as we zoom in, we can actually look at um, the raw features. If we get down to the street level, we'll be able to render. Um, this time I did put a scale dependency render on, on my feature layer. I added the feature layer right here and actually have the map service. And they turn on and off based on my scale. But the cool thing I wanted to show is you can actually actually add the the feature layer or the map service layer and leverage the full power of the WebGIS stack here. So this is just creating a unique value renderer here. Again, we can always query for the point and get the pop-up window and get the information back. Uh, one, one last thing I wanted to showcase here, if I zoom back out um, to more of the DC area here, we can see that I can come in here and I can actually filter the data. So we can actually filter based on something like the, the fence, right? So we can say, give me this uh, unique values, and then we can say, show me all the burglaries and see how that looks. And then we can render the map and we can see that our map changes based on our filtering. You can see the aggregation show now a little bit centralized in downtown, but now you can see outliers are turning a little bit red or hotspot right there. 
Again, we can do the same. We can edit our filter. One other neat one is homicide. There's less homicides. Thank goodness for that. And then you can see their hotspot is in the southeast area. Cool. I think that's all I got for that. Okay. All right, so I know you guys are probably wondering, that's really neat, but how do, we, how do I get my data into the spatial temporal big data store, right? Well, this is how we do it. So as we just saw, and Adam explained earlier on, we have the ArcGIS Enterprise stack right there, and that consists of our map and feature services, and actually we have these feature services that actually read from the spatial temporal big data store using what we call data sources. And how do we get that data in there? Well, we use GeoVent server to write out in a very efficient, very timely manner to the big data store using outputs. And I'll showcase that in a second. And then how do we get the data into GeoVent server? Well, we have various number of inputs we can read from and then write out to the spatial temporal big data store. So let me show how we, how do I, um, how did I recreate that crime map that we just saw. I'm going to go ahead and recreate it right here. Okay, so here's the, the dashboard for ArcGIS GeoVent Manager. So as you're seeing, we, we have three data feeds coming in. We have three services right now. And um, here's three inputs and we have three outputs. Very simple right now, my setup. Um, as I mentioned before, we're consuming the FlightAware feed through WebSocket input, and then we have um, the weather stations being pulled from feature services, and then the crime I'm actually simulating through our simulator. Through I'm reading a CSV file, simulating that data in. Um, so the first thing I would do if I wanted to recreate that crimes uh, map is actually I want I would like to uh, create a what we call a data source in the spatial temporal big data store. So I would click on the site tab. And then when you click on the site tab, you'll notice there's another tab in here called the Spatial Temporal Big Data Stores. And then in this page right here, you're gonna see we have a cool little UI for you to manage your Spatial Temporal Big Data Stores. And not only that, you can manage what we call data sources and your map services associated with them and your feature services as well. Uh, the cool thing to note right here is actually that we can edit properties of your data sources, we can delete data, we can clone it. We can actually create new map services that reference the same data source because we know your data is probably pretty big. You don't want to uh, copy around, maybe just recreate different map services and feature services. Or you can just delete the whole row and delete map services and feature services altogether with the data source. So first thing I would do here is just go ahead and create the data source by clicking on the Create Data Source button. So we bring up a form here that actually has a lot of many of these uh, input or text boxes are already filled in with what we believe are the best defaults for uh, writing data into the spatial temporal big data store. So first thing we need is actually the schema. So the schema I'm going to point to my crimes and file schema, which represents the crime schema that's being simulated in. Uh, and I'll give it a new name. I'm going to call this new crimes. Uh, of course, you select your uh, geometry type. It's point data, but we support all the other ones as well. I'm um, not going to go into much of these advanced um, spatial temporal options like replication factor and number shards. We'll be discussing some of those a little later. Um, next thing I would do, I'm going to create a, I'm going to select my display field, which is a fence. And then I wanted to point out we have um, these new aggregation styles at 10.5. So out of the box, you always get the geohash aggregation style. But now at 10.5, you have the ability to add a square, uh, a flat hexagon, and a pointy hexagon with a targeted spatial reference. That's very important because sometimes um, maybe your base map is not always Web Mercator. You can actually add your different aggregation style, which is very important when we write the data, we index it in that spatial projection that you are targeting, and your data will actually align properly and not be reprojected when you show the map. So that's very important right there. So out of the box, we add the three for, for most use cases. It's probably okay, um, but you can definitely add more. One, one thing to note right here is be careful. You don't want to add all of them because then, then you're affecting your write performance because we're re-indexing the same data over and over. 
Um, let's take a look real quick at the aggregation render. This is our new render for that map service that we just saw. And we'll be going in a little later in the presentation, we'll explore more of these options in details. But the one thing I wanted to mention is here's that feature threshold uh, a property that I, that I showcased a little earlier in the flights map. You can set that to a value. Right now it's defaulted to always aggregate by bins, uh, but you can set it something higher so then you can show the raw features which is pretty neat. Um, and then this is your default aggregation styling. You, it defaults to GeoHash, but if you added those aggregation styles right above, you have the option to say, no, always display uh, square or flat hexagon or, or some other style you want. Um, here's the other neat thing here. Um, we have the method. So out of the box, we do by count. So aggregate by counts. But the, like we saw in that temperature map, you can say, no, I actually want to do statistics on my data. Don't aggregate by counts, aggregate by statistics. So you select statistics and you can see the drop down of all numeric fields you can do statistics on. Unfortunately, my crime data only has the Latin long, but if you had more fields, you, would, you could do that. And then your type, right? We have support very standard ones, average, max, man, standard deviation, sum, and so forth. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and default this to counts like before. And then there's labeling options, um, color, uh, bin sizes that you want to uh, play around with. Uh, one more thing is the feature rendering. Of course, this is like, this is uh, telling your client this, when you go into raw feature mode, this is what you want to display your raw features like. Um, and then here we have the little quick pointer, which I like when it points, it does a little pointer and does the, uh, the heading. You can actually set the rotation to here as well as we showcase in the flight map. It's worth noting that these are the defaults for the map service. You can override these at runtime, as you'll see in the next demo that we do. Yeah. And the last, lastly, just one quick, quick thing I think it's important is the time info. This actually controls that time slider you guys saw. Many of our web clients support the time sliding, uh, time animation. And this tells, gives the time slider a hint, uh, step through by this time interval, like 10 seconds, 10 minutes, hours, and so forth. So I would go ahead and hit publish here. And then um, while, it, while it's doing that, we can actually um, start creating the output as well. But one thing to note, we're creating the data source and we're creating the map service and the feature service all at once. This might take a few seconds here. Um, while it does that, we can go in and, and do the next step, which is we want to create an output. Um, so what we want to do is actually here we can see we have the crimes, flights, and, and weather stations already outputs that we've already created. Um, so it's simply to create another output to tell kind of GeoVent where to store that data. We would hit the add output uh, button. And we can search for many what we call output connectors. Um, if I search for BDS for Big Data Store, we can see we have two output connectors for the spatial temporal Big Data Store. We have the add of features, which is actually um, just storing all the observational data. And we actually have the update as well. The update, just to note the difference is it actually stores just the latest position of your, of your track, by track ID, which is very important. You need a track ID to use this update one. So if we tap back, yep, there's our new one. It's been published already, new crimes with the map and feature service. So now we can go ahead and add and create that, um, that output. So first thing again, um, very simple form this one. You would come in here and you would give it a name. I'm going to give it new crimes out and then give it the schema or the, what we call the GeoVent definition and then point to the right data source, which is new crimes. And that's it. We save it and we've created our new output. So the next thing we want to do is connect the data flow. I know we have an input already simulating data, so now let's connect it to our output so it writes it to it. So I have an existing service already. It's called uh, Crimes to BDS. So let's just simply edit this one. And you're going to see it has a simple input, which is our TCP inputs uh, listening to the simulator and writing to our old BDS output. So let's just connect our, our um, new Crimes output. Just drag it onto the canvas. And then just drag a little connector here to it. And that's it. So now the data will flow from the input to two outputs at the same time. So I hit publish. And once that's done, now we're going to have data flowing to both outputs. And one last thing, I'm just going to go ahead and add that new crimes map 
to a blank map here. There it is. So if I go ahead and add it, give it a second, and that, there's my data. It's flowing at uh, about 10, 10 events per second right now. So first thing you might say is why isn't it aggregating? Well, remember our feature threshold set to 1,000, so hasn't reached 1,000 quite yet, but we can definitely uh, increase the simulation. Oh yeah, good point. Let me, let me set my map to refresh as well. <laughs> That'll help. Let's set that up. All right, so it refreshes every six seconds or so. Um, and yep, so then we can increase the data flow by tenfold. And we should see the bins pop up in a few seconds here. There you go. Pretty neat, right? Cool. Back to you, Adam. All right, so let's talk about how the on-the-fly aggregations work. We're gonna give you a little peek under the hood of what's actually happening. So as data is written into the spatial temporal big data store, as Ricardo said, we're always enabling geohash aggregation. Uh, so if you're familiar with Elasticsearch, this is something co that comes with Elasticsearch, and so there's nothing really special we had to do for geohash other than expose the capability. Uh, so this is writing a geohash spatial index every time we write that. A lot of our customers, when we released this at 10.4, the only aggregation we supported was geohash. So at 10.5, we added a bunch of extensions for Elastic, the first one being a square aggregation. Uh, so you can hardly see it in this uh, part of the world, but uh, the geohashes are rectangular things, so as you get closer to the poles, you see kind of tall rectangles. And a lot of our customers in the UK and Australia and other places like that didn't really like that uh, for their visualizations. So the square gives you a consistent uh, type of uh, area that you can, you can render. And also when you're projecting this to other projection systems, it doesn't work very well with geohash as well. Another uh, index that we've added at 10.5 is the ability to do triangles. So you might be wondering, well, why the heck would I want to look at triangles on a map? Well, triangles form the foundation for hexagons. And so as you'll see here, as the animation goes through, we're using this triangle index to basically create our geohash, or I'm sorry, our uh, hexagon aggregations. And so you can choose if you want a pointy triangle or a flat triangle, and depending on you know, which one you use, your hexagon would be you know, pointed a different direction. So whichever way you want to show it is the one that you can enable. So all of the different indexes that we write here, if you enable all of the ones like Ricardo did, then there's basically four types of spatial indices that are supported. Uh, and every time you write your data into the big data store, it's gonna be indexing across all of these. This uh, fortunately is an asynchronous task. So you write your data to the elastic and then it's doing that on the fly as fast as it can do it. Uh, it's very fast, it keeps up with high rates of data even at thousands of events per second. Uh, this is in addition to a temporal index that's on the time field. So this is what makes the, the big data store a spatial temporal data store is because we're doing both space and time. Uh, and then you can query across either dimensions of that that you like. But what we also do is we invert an index on all the other attributes as well. So what that allows you to do is you can actually query across any of the other attribute fields as well. If they're strings or they're ranges of numbers or whatever they might be, we're indexing all of the other attributes as well so that when you do a where clause and you say where it's in this area and it's between this time and this time and it's a delta flight and it's less than 20,000 feet, it's super efficient to go do that because we're hitting all kinds of attribute indexes as well. So uh, a little deeper dive into this since this is a developer summit, the response type that you can get new at 10.5 uh, with the feature service, this is not on the form when you go to the feature service and the rest services directory, so you need to know that this property is there. And the reason why it's not in the form is that the feature service supports lots of different types of data stores. It's not just the spatial temporal. And so LODs are not currently capable on the relational data store and other things that the feature service can hit. So uh, you need to specify this LOD, which is a level of detail, and this is what the aggregation style is. So if you ask a feature service for give me an LOD type of geohash and a level of detail two, that would be kind of like your zoom extent. Like how big of a box do you want two would be really big, like you know a few boxes around North America. Uh, and if you did like a level of detail of 22, that would be like at my house, uh, kind of square. Uh, you can get into you know, those different level of details. 
So when I ask a feature service for an LOD type and an LOD, it doesn't give me back the raw features, it gives me back an aggregate result. So what's cool about this is then you can render it on the client side however you see fit. So on the left is the map service that was controlled by all the different aggregation styles that Ricardo showed. But if you want to do like a real-time heat map or something like that, you can use these uh, aggregations to give you back aggregate results over tremendously big data. Uh, we've tested this with you know, billions of observations and other things in feature services, and it still performs quite well. Um, another option, too, with GeoHash is that GeoHash is an industry standard. So you don't necessarily need to return the geometries back to the client. You can you know, employ uh, a library inside of JavaScript that already knows how to render uh, GeoHash. And so you don't need to ask for the geometries. You could actually kind of optimize this a bit. And if you're, when you're working with GeoHash, just get the GeoHash ID and then render it on the client side. There's more work that's going on in the JavaScript API to support this better in the future. Uh, but for right now, you kind of have to, to know how to render those on your own. With squares, uh, we have devised our own kind of technique on how we uh, aggregate these things together. It's a little bit misleading because the attributes that get returned back, there's one called GeoHash. It actually has nothing to do with GeoHash. This is what our square ID is. So, you know, we don't really have full control at Esri over the GeoRest service spec. There's a standards body and other folks. So we're working with them to actually change this to be something more generic over time. But for right now, it says GeoHash, a little misleading but it's actually a square ID of what's coming back. And then you get the count, and if you ask for the geometry, you would get you know, the five sides of the, the square to close it off. And then you get your spatial reference if you had happened to set that to something different. In a flat hexagon, it's the same type of thing, flat or pointy hexagon. You give it an LOD type and an LOD, uh, and you would get back uh, the ID for that hexagon. Uh, we've got a whole white paper on like how we devised you know, splitting up the world into triangles and hexagons and other things. If you're interested, talk to us afterwards. But if you want to know why it's negative one colon one is the ID, we, can, we have a white paper that explains all that. We're not going to go through it in this session. That could probably be another session maybe for UC. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and then projection is really important as well. So uh, a lot of our customers at 10.4 that were working with GeoHash saw things like on the left when they tried to project the... Uh, the data to a different uh, projection system. And now with squares, we actually get really good results uh, that look like something on the right, which is what you would more expect to see. So another detail, since this is a developer conference, if you want to query a feature service or a map service and figure out what LODs it supports, sorry, it's kind of small, but there's a lot of data on this, uh, is you can ask that map server uh, layer or the feature server layer, both feature server yep. and map server, right? Yep. Well, and you can say, uh, just question mark F equals JSON on the layer with nothing else. And if you do that, it'll give you back a bunch of metadata about that layer. So part of that metadata is an LOD infos section. And that LOD infos section tells you that this thing has a geo hash, it has 12 uh, levels. Uh, there's also a flat hexagon that has 20 levels. Uh, and this is the, the wicked that it's uh, oriented against. And so this will give you information when you're building a JavaScript client to know when you inter interact with a feature service if it supports these different types of aggregations or not. So with that, uh, Ricardo is going to show you a couple open source uh, projects that we created. These are very simple JavaScript apl applications that show you the range of different options that you can adjust at runtime uh, with the map server on the left. Uh, and then we've got one with the feature layer on the right. I'll bring this back up after the presentation in case you guys want to grab the, the links again. But Ricardo's going to walk us through this app. It's free. It's Apache license. You can take it, fork it, do whatever you want with it. Thanks, Adam. All right. So here's the map service um, JavaScript app. I haven't run it, running it here locally. Um, one cool thing um, this does is like Adam mentioned, it allows you to explore the full breadth of all the aggregation style settings that we have exposed. Um, so let's just walk through a couple of those. Um, one, one thing I like here is also you can actually change the coordinate system of the map, actually, which is kind of neat when testing your different um, aggregation styles. So you can come in here and say, OK, let's try you know, NAT83 NAT UTM zone 11. And then there it goes. It reprojected the map with the bins. Obviously, it reprojected the bins because I don't have a spatial reference for this type of aggregation. This is GeoHash right now. So I mean, th that's quite useful. I like that. Um, let's just switch it back to WebMarketer. 
Uh, one other thing here is, um, so this LOD offset, it's kind of neat, I like to play around with this too, is you can say, okay, I know map service, you're, you're smart, you're, de you're detecting the level of detail I actually might want, but I'm gonna override that and say always add one to it, plus one to it. And that plus one would allow you to get smaller bins, um, more detail. Um, or you can do the opposite and you can say, well, you know, minus one. Um, and you can get big bins, right? So depending on what kind of map you wanna set up or visualize, might be useful. Um, similarly, you can change the actual bin size and pixels here. Um, so you can actually say, no, I don't want 20, I want um, something like 15. And then it should create smaller bins, see? So that's kinda neat, play around with that. Um, of course, this is our favorite one. You can switch to uh, the different styles we have. Flat hexagon, and it'll then hit the flat hexagon index. I got a caveat there. This is still the flight map, so I'm still rendering like almost, what, 30 million <laughs> records? Oh, come on, it's coming. All right, no? Live demos. Don't fail me now. Ah. Maybe you should pan just to nudge it. All right. Let's try panning, zooming in. Hmm. Oh, that's a bummer. Maybe it's our Wi-Fi. All right, keep going. All right. I'll switch it back to GeoHash. All right, let me just reload. JavaScript app. Okay. Set the layer. Hmm. Looks like the Wi-Fi is causing us a problem. No, not now. All right, why don't you move on to the feature service? Okay. Well, let's see this one. Uh, so this is a feature service app we have, and this, like Adam said, it's, it's actually querying for those LOD geometries and bringing them back here. Um, again, we can play around with the different settings and we can say, okay, give me like a higher LOD level, like LOD4. You see that, that actually brings smaller bins, or we can say, no, um, let's do bigger bins, like two. That, there you go. One cool thing I like about this one, oops, I'm clicking too fast, um, is we can actually, like Adam said, we can use the smart map renders and do like a heat map, which is kind of neat. I think you guys might like that. Uh, depends on your LOD, you get a different kind of heat map because we're using the centroids of the, of the bins, right, to use the heat map. That's, that's pretty neat. So that heat map will refresh every you know, six seconds or what yeah, as well, so, so it's a dynamic heat map? Yeah, it's dynamic. So if I, if I select live, because now it's, it's doing a refresh, so it's, it's dynamically updating. Um, kind of flickered there in a second, but that's kind of cool. Um, and oh, the one thing I wanted to showcase here is um, what Adam was mentioning is, here's the query that we're doing. This is, this is a developer conference. So here's our, our query parameters, LOD5, LOD type, geohash, and the out special reference. And then you get, you get like Adam mentioned, um, still a feature set with different attributes and your geometry. Pretty neat, huh? Let's see, should we try the map? Oh, there's the map. Wanna go one through again? All right, Adam, try. what do you yeah. think? I'll cross my <laughs> fingers, go for it. One more try, here we go. So let's zoom in closer. I think if we zoom in closer, um, that way there's less data. I think it was the Wi-Fi actually. All right, so let's, let's get the bigger bins. Flat hexagon. There we go, woohoo, yay. Live demos, there we go. Pointy hexagon. Better flip over now. <laughs> <laughs> we just got applause. I'm pushing it. <laughs> All right, but 
but there's there's a lot of options you guys can explore here. Um, just to just to bring that up. One one other thing. Let's see if I can get this going. If I zoom in close enough. No, stuck again. All right, bad Wi-Fi. All right, let's flip over. Right. All right, so those are open source. You can uh, play around with those yourself, so I'll give you a moment to capture the links if you want those. These slides will also be publicly available. So the next thing we're going to run into or talk about is, uh, okay, so how does Geoanalytics interact with the Spatial Temporal Data Store? So writing analytic results from Geoanalytics server can happen in a, in a couple ways. Uh, Geoanalytics, if you're not familiar with uh, this uh, after this week so far, uh, is basically a capability that allows you to run parallel analytics on massive scale data. And so within Pro, this is kind of a drop down screenshot of the different analytics that you can run within Geoanalytics. These tools can also be uh, executed from a portal that you have as well. So they're available through a UI in Pro or through the, the portal interface. As far as the tools that are available, uh, there's you know aggregation and summarization that can happen. So certainly the Spatial Temporal Data Store provides you a lot of aggregation capabilities, but if you want more fine-grained control over the bend sizes and some of the other aspects of that, uh, and you want to produce a static result, you can use these aggregate points. Uh, but you can also do cool things like reconstruct tracks, which we'll deeper dive into in a second. Uh, there's find similar locations, uh, as well as uh, pattern uh, identification, like calculate density. Uh, and there's also a really cool uh, tool for creating a space-time cube, uh, which can be rendered in a 3D space uh, using NetCDF inside of Pro. Uh, we also have uh, the ability to create buffers, and then uh, if you just simply want to get your data into the big data store and do exploratory analysis, as we've, as we've been kind of been looking at here, you can just use the copy to data store tool. Uh, and then finally, join features is probably one of the most versatile tools that's available. You can join features uh, by space, by time, or by attribute, or by any combination of those three. Uh, so it's quite powerful. It's a spatial, temporal, and attribute join uh, that you can perform on your data. Uh, Geoanalytics has the ability to uh, perform analysis against data that's within the spatial, temporal, big data store. Uh, so it would run analysis, and then the results of that typically get written back into the Spatial Temporal Big Data Store. It's also an option to write data back into the Relational Data Store if you'd prefer to have it in there, but a lot of folks are using the, the Big Data Store to do this so that they have the aggregation capabilities and other things as well. This produces new WebGIS layers that then can be consumed within the rest of our platform through Pro, Portal, our new Python notebooks, or if you're at a developer level wanting to get integrate with it through the REST API. Uh, another use case for geoanalytics is to pull in data from external sources. Uh, so we support a number of different big data file shares. Uh, those could be a folder full of uh, CSV or delimited text files, a uh, folder full of shape files. We have lots of customers that have thousands of shape files that they want to run analysis on. Uh, or if you've invested in a Hadoop system and have Hive or HDFS in place, uh, we can certainly connect to those systems as well. Uh, with Hive, you just put in your meta server uh, URL, URL in there. We can connect to it and then explore the data that you have in there uh, and, and do analysis on it and write the results back to the Spatial Temporal Big Data Store. If you have data in a feature service that's hosted somewhere else, we can certainly connect to that. That's not the quickest way to get data into uh, Geoanalytics server, but uh, the big data file shares are quite quick. And then also running analysis on data in the, the Big Data Store is, is very fast as well. Again, this produces new WebGIS layers. Uh, so a copy to data store geoanalytics tool experience would look something like this. Uh, it takes a little longer to demo these things, so we're just going to show you some screenshots of us running this previously. Uh, so this is you know, pointing at a feature server. Uh, I can pull in that data and give it a name and then tell it where I want the, the data to be written. In this case, it's a spatial temporal data store. And then what I would get is uh, resultant output features that I could then visualize through a feature service. Uh, also, if you run a thing like a reconstruct tracks tool, you're typically working with uh, data that's, you know, like the flight data that, that Ricardo has been showing, where you have the map service with aggregate results. And then what you're seeing on top of this is the actual latest position of the flights uh, using another layer. And so we're going to take that historic data and actually reconstruct the tracks. And what you would get is something that looks like this, where we reconstruct the tracks for those individuals. And this can work on, you know, hundreds of millions of observations that you have. Uh, and produce results within a, a couple to a few minutes. Uh, with that, we're almost towards the end. I think I have enough time to show you an R&D project sneak peek. 
Uh, there's a lot of best practices on the spatial temporal data store that I omitted from this session uh, because we simply didn't have the time to cover it in the session, but I covered it in a best practice session that was titled Geo Event Server Best Practices. So if you're planning to use the spatial temporal data store, uh, all of these sessions are being recorded and they'll be on our E380 website uh, a couple weeks after this event. I'd highly suggest to fast forward to that section and, and watch the big data store best practices. There's lots of common gotchas and other things that you'll wanna uh, go through that content for. With that, I'm gonna give you a couple uh, sneak peeks into some projects that we're thinking about. Uh, so this is all really cool. Uh, what do we do next? So what's some of our 10.6 R&D projects that we're doing? Well, the first is uh, Project Poly, which is uh, being able to do this, but on general polygons. So this is typically the second question I get after the licensing question is, can you do polygon aggregation on the fly? Uh, if we can get the performance good enough in our R&D efforts that we're doing now, which we feel pretty confident that we can, you'll be able to, just like you add square and hexagon, you'll be able to say, I wanna add polygon, and then we will ask you, where is your polygon layer? Point us to a data source in your big data store that has that polygon. And then we'll be able to, as we write data, index on the fly against those polygons. So if you choose counties or states, then we can quickly render these things back through polygons as well. Uh, so this is an R&D project we're working on. I'm not gonna demo this one, uh, but the one I am gonna demo is uh, Project Qbert. So this is, you know, for those of you old enough to know Qbert, the video game in the 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, this is basically taking the concepts that we've done for GeoHash, Square, and Hexagon and adding another dimension to it where we have a temporal dimension that brings us uh, basically a collection of all of these geo hashes and squares. So instead of getting one aggregate result and rendering colors on the map, let's render uh, every hour of the day 24 time slices and render it as a space-time cube on the fly. So this is another project that we're working on. We call it Qbert, uh, and this allows us to do exploratory analysis on the fly with this. So this combines a number of teams within Esri to to pull this off, uh, mainly being the WebGL team uh, on the JavaScript side. And the idea here is that just like we've been showing you before, we can do a query for LOD type geohash at level of detail two, but we can give it a start and an end time. And then we can add these additional parameters. These are the new things that we're thinking about doing for 10.6 uh, of time interval one, time unit hour. And if we do that, that'll split up that 24 hour period into 24 time slices. And so what I would get back is something that looks like on the right. So currently at 10.5, you get something that looks like on the left where you get your geo hashes and your counts. Uh, but on the right, we actually see an array of time slices of aggregated features. That takes a minute to interpret, but it's you know, basically an array of the time slices of the aggregations that are calculated on the fly for these things. And again, this data could be changing. So. Uh, the space-time cube could sink into the Earth because a new hour appears and we're only looking at the last 24 hours and then we get a new layer that appears on the top when a new hour comes in. So I'm gonna show you, uh, oh, another thing we're considering too is that the responses for these things can be quite large. So if you're doing level of detail 22 and you're doing it over 24 hours, it could be a really big response. So we're also considering protoboff as a, as a format to support uh, for this, and that might have ramifications for other aspects of the platform as well to support protobuf. Uh, so that's something we're, we're looking into. We don't have that implemented yet, but something we're considering to increase the response time. So with that, I'm gonna show you a demo. This data that we're gonna show is from a business partner of ours called SafeGraph. Uh, they pull in data from all kinds of different mobile apps, and so it's anonymized cell phone data. Uh, the feature service I'm gonna hit has 1.4 billion records in it. Uh, and we're gonna render some space-time cubes on, on these things. So let's go and hope that this demo works. We'll see if the Wi-Fi works for me. Crossing fingers. So this is a, a three-dimensional view of New York City with you know, different uh, data that's coming in. What we're looking at here is geo hashes. This is nothing new. This is stuff that we've been doing at 10.5. With WebGL, we can render this data super quick, so I'm sliding through time uh, through these different geo hashes that have happened. I can view that through you know, a, a geo hash. Uh, you know, I can kind of rotate this as well so you can kind of see the rendering performance here. I can actually look at the hexagons as well, or I can look at cylindrical structures that we render uh, just using client side techniques. And so uh, with this, uh, something else we've been working on is how do we render a 3D heat map uh, that's on the fly? So if we do something like that, we can see a structure like this. So my friend Monsieur here in the front row has been uh, working heavy on this, and, and we've leveraged a lot of this. And what we can see is actually that 3D heat mesh changing over time. 
If I zoom out a bit, it might look a little nicer. Here we go, and you can kind of see the density of phone calls that have been happening over time throughout this area. But taking it a step further, we can actually say, let's actually do a space-time cube. And for the purpose of this demo, I picked a smaller subset of the data just so I could actually get it to, to render. We're still working on this as an R&D project. And uh, what I'm going to show you is if we adjust the time slider here, we can actually see the space-time volumes being created. And I call them a space-time volume instead of a space-time cube because I can actually look at them as triangles, hexagons, other things. So it's really a space-time hexagon that we're looking at here. And so the next step for this demo, which you'll probably see at UC, probably on the main stage and other things, is that we'll have exploratory analysis enabled on this as well, uh, such that we can go in and say a where clause, where it's an Android device, where it's you know, iPhone and it's you know, been lingering in the same location for less than you know, 10, 10 minutes or things like that. So this is kind of a sneak peek glimpse into uh, some of the additional aggregation capabilities that we're planning for uh, the spatial temporal data store. Pretty cool, huh? So I'm going to summarize here and uh, make sure we have enough time for Q&A. Actually, I'll just skip the summary because I think you guys uh, got the gist of what this is about. Uh, the one point I'll make on this slide, though, is that there's a really nice tutorial, the step-by-step -step workflow. How do you install the big data store? How do you register it with your portal? How do you get started? How do you start writing data like Ricardo walked through? All of that is step-by-step -step documented in this tutorial. Uh, there's a quick Esri short link there that you can get to it. It's uh, SPDS. And uh, just take a look at that. The big data store interface that Ricardo showed of how you administer the map and feature services, right now it's in the geo event product because spatial temporal big data store kind of got originated by the geo event team. Uh, but now that geo analytics is using it as well, it's really not the best location. So expect in 10.6 and other releases that we pull those things out and actually have a proper interface for a lot of these things uh, outside of, of geo event or geo analytics specifically. Uh, there's a few other sessions on uh, real-time and big data uh, remaining in the, the conference here. Uh, if you're interested in 3D, you know, there's a session tomorrow morning that will kind of walk through some of the, the latest things we've been doing with real-time and, and 3D. Uh, and then with that, I want to leave uh, time for questions. Do so you guys have any questions or feedback? Yes? Does your big data support with an license? With a what license? Oh, uh, so the question is, does your big data store come with an XPAC license? So XPAC is uh, additional license that extends elastic capabilities to support more features. Uh, so we don't uh, ship big data store with an XPAC license because we would have to OEM the XPAC licenses. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work. If you caught my Trinity session yesterday about like doing massive scale things, we're actually embedding XPAC in those things. Uh, so that'll enable a lot of additional things like if you're a defense or intel agency customer and you want to do cell level access and things of that nature. Uh, some of those things are possible. We've tested those with the big data store. It works very well. Uh, we just don't ship 10.5 with XPAC pre-installed. Uh, it's a good question that you asked, though, like, can you add it after the fact? So um, I don't know the answer to that. We're going to have to test that and see. Yeah. Oh, no. No. Yeah, so the, the comment is the additional add-on would be, you know, additional security that we can add on. So we do secure our spatial temporal data store. We've written our own kind of capabilities so that we make sure that nobody can access it outside of Esri components. Uh, so that's good and bad because it's not open to you to just connect to you. Uh, but it's good because nobody can connect to it without the right credentials and everything. So we've secured it, just not through XPAC. We looked at that as an option, but it wasn't, it didn't make business sense for us. So. Any other questions or feedback? All right, well, thanks for your time. We'll stick around. <laughs>